Clearly, it's not practical to have a new HTTP request client in every single page or module that we need it in. So it's much better to create a client for HTTP requests, and that's exactly what we're going to do here. Right, so we want to create a client for our HTTP request. So let's sit, let's cite this client inside a brand new folder that makes sense. And because we're going to be using the data that comes from client in our data model, perhaps a folder called model would make sense. So under QML, click add new, go to vplay apps, item, item is what we want, hit choose, browse, and let's create that new folder. Model, select that folder, and then let's call this really simply client. We don't need to specify HTTP here because it is the only client. But if it wasn't the only client, then you might actually want to specify what it is and what it should be for. Okay, so let's finish that. And there we have our very, very basic item. Now this doesn't need an ID. What does it need though? Well, first of all, if you recall, we had a loading function. So where was that? That was under pages, I think, under the main, no, under search page. That's where it was. We had this indicator bar item. And we said when we're off collecting HTTP data, we want to make this into uh, something that shows whether we're doing that or not. And so that comes back to our client page where we can actually get a property. And we're going to make this read only so we can't change it externally. Uh, property. And handily, the IDE tells us what we need to add to this. First, it needs a type. And in this case, the type is a Boolean, simply true or false. If you press tab once you've filled in a type, as I haven't here. Uh, yeah, if you hit tab, when it's highlighted, then you can go on to the next one. So bool. And what are we going to call this? Well, let's just call this loading. Hit tab again. Now, how do we know when we're loading? Well, remember that I said on each device, Android, iOS, there's a little teeny tiny indicator at the top that tells you that you're making a network call, a little spinning circle of sorts. This is called the HTTP Network Activity Indicator. So vPlay's done all the hard work, it goes and finds that object for us, depending on what platform we're running, and it just simply exposes it to here to our item. So what do we wanna do? Well, we wanna see if that's enabled, and then if that's enabled or disabled, true or false, we're gonna set it to the loading parameter here. Now we'll wire up that loading parameter a little bit later. Now, what's the next thing we're going to do? Well, it's just a little nicety. And it's going to show you a little bit of what's called a component life cycle. What do I mean by that? Well, when this item is created or a page is created or anything, absolutely anything is created, it goes through a life cycle. So first it says something like, and this isn't true to life, but it's something like this. It says, hey, I'm ready to load. Then it says, I'm finished loading. And then it says, I'm about to display. Then it says, I'm finished displaying. And so you can run through a life cycle and hook into the events as they happen in order to achieve something. So in our case, we're gonna go component dot. And if you just type on, it'll show you all the various things that, that you have. On completed is what we want. So as soon as this component loads, we're gonna do something. And the reason that we wait for it to load is to be sure that everything we need to access is ready to be accessed. Otherwise we'll have, of course, a horrible mess on our hands. Everything will crash. And what are we going to access? Well, our activity indicator, and we're going to change what's called the activation delay. So normally your device will wait for one whole second, a thousand milliseconds, until it shows that network activity indicator in the very top bar. So we don't want that to happen. We want the user to know instantly, instant feedback, that something is happening. So we're changing that default value for this app. Okay, that's just a nicety. It's not necessary for the entirety of this course, of course. So now what are we gonna do? Well, we're gonna create an item here. And this item, the reason we're creating an item inside of an item is so we can keep it private. And how do we know it's private? Well, let's use the convention of calling this just underscore. Its ID is underscore. And to help you remember that, you can put a comment in 
that's with the double forward slash private member. And if you're new to programming, all a comment is is something we read as the programmer, but the program doesn't execute and strips out when it does actually uh, compile your program. Okay, so we have that. Then we want to create, let's see, our server URL. So what does that look like? Well, this value isn't going to change, so we're going to make it read-only. We'll call it property, obviously. It'll be a string, because it's just a bunch of text rammed together. And we will call this server URL. Now, what is this going to be? Well, this will be the actual server we're trying to access, which is HTTP API dot Nestoria dot co dot UK forward slash API question mark. And so if you're new to HTTP requests, question mark simply indicates that these are parameters I'm about to send you. So parameter one here is country, which we have to set as equal to something, UK. And then we add another parameter, we say and something. We want this to be formatted in a pretty manner, equal to one for true. Now, these things that we're passing over to the API are unique to the API itself. Obviously, this stuff doesn't work on every API, just in case you're new to this. Then we're going to ask for the particular type of encoding that we need. So this typically these days is JSON. In the old days, it used to be XML. Uh, maybe you can even just get plain text back, but that's not very useful for anyone. And then we're going to say listing underscore type equal to by. So it's going to pass back all the properties that are available to buy. Obviously, we could have rent in that. We could change that as we need. But seeing as this is a purchasing app, that's what we're going to have. So I'll just scroll across so you can see that clearly, that whole URL, just for a second, because it's scrolling off my screen here. Okay. So now we know where our API is. We can do something called building a uh, the URL. Okay, because it needs to know some other data. If you ask for all the listings in the UK, that's a lot of listings. So what we're going to do is add some more parameters to the end of that URL. And we're going to do that using a function, because it's more complicated than a single command. Build URL. And what we're going to pass into here is a param map. And a param map is simply a list of key and value pairs that we're just going to add to the end of this server URL that we have existing. So let's create a local copy of the URL equals server URL. And then we're going to loop through using a for loop each parameter inside of our param map. So that's the map we pass in here. So for each one, we're going to add it to the end of our our URL string. And the way we add it in shorthand is URL plus equals. So that just takes the string and adds what we're going to ask it to add to the end. So of course we want to add an and to say this is another parameter incoming. We're going to say we want you to add the param plus the equals symbol plus the param map and because this is an array, we use the square brackets, go find the value of that param. Now, if you're not familiar with all of this, then feel free to take one of my more beginner courses because I explain all of this stuff in those. So we've done that. We can now return that URL, the one that we have a local copy of. Okay, so that makes our param map. Now, it would be very, very useful if we had a store of the last param map we created. So let's actually do that up here somewhere after the server URL, I think. Let's simply call this uh, property var last param map. And I'm just foreshadowing what we're going to do later on. We're going to not going to implement this right away. So we're just going to say, hey, this is uh, a JavaScript object that we're going to fill in at some point. Okay, so now we've done all that, we're ready to build the URL. What should we do now? Well, all that's left really to do is to send a request. And we're going to pass in 
a param map. So that's going to come when we call this send request. And what else is it going to pass in? Well, here's where we get into the callback. And the callback is the function that you pass along into here that will be executed later on in a different object, in a different item. So we're saying send a request with our parameters, get the data. Once you've got the data, run this function that I specify and pass the data into that. So that'll, if that's not clear right now, it will become clear as we create this. Okay, so we've got our request. Now the first thing we need to do, we're going to do this a bit more in depth than the previous one we created. Var method equals to get. And look up HTTP methods. You've got get, post, delete. Uh, there's one more that I, slips my mind. But yeah, you get it. Then we're going to ask for a URL. And how are we going to get that? Well, we're going to build that URL. Whoops. Build URL. And we're going to pass in, you guessed it, the param map. So now we have a fully fledged URL. Now it's a good idea here to have a console debug which is going to show us what our method is and put a little space between all of these. So it's going to say get plus URL. So it's just a little message to ourselves so we know that all of this is actually working. Right, let's create a little space on the screen here. Now what do we need? Well, the rest you should be familiar with. HTTP request dot get, pass in our URL, and then do something with it. So let's have a function with that result. Let me just tidy up my brackets. Oops, I've deleted one off there. Okay, so we have our function with our result. We grab the content from that result, which is result.text, and then we use our usual try catch because we might actually mess this up. We try to create an object, a JavaScript object from the JSON content. And if all of that goes horribly wrong, we're going to catch our exception. What are we gonna do? Well, let's give ourselves that console.error and let's say, could not pass JSON and pass ourselves the exception so we can read exactly what that says. And then if it's all gone wrong, we can't do anything else, so we'll just return. But if it's all gone right, we can console.debug. And what are we going to say here? Success passing JSON. Not with a double bracket, though, although that might actually work. Success passing JSON. Now, here comes the final step. We're going to use that callback, that function that we're passing in, and we're going to give it the data, that object that we tried to create over here. Okay, and then finally, don't forget after the dot then, everything could fail miserably. So let's have a catch here with a function error. And what are we going to do? Well, we could have a console write line here. Actually, we will have one. Console.debug fatal error in URL get. Yeah, I've done it again with my brackets. I forget about the autocomplete here sometimes. Okay, and the very, very final step is to say last param map. Remember that stores our last parameter map is equal to the current one. So that will store it for later. Right, so that's a lot of code, but we've now tidied this request away into its own separate client, which is always a good idea. Now we haven't been able to create a method to access it yet, and that's something that we're going to start building in the next lecture.